2. The Object of Critique in the Critique of Political Economy In Capital, Marx examines the capitalist mode of production. The question, however, is in what manner capitalism is the object of study. In the text, there are abstract theoretical inquiries into money and capital, as well as historical passages, such as those dealing with the development of capitalist relations in England. Is capital first and foremost concerned with the main features of the history of capitalist development, or with a particular phase of capitalism, or is the point rather an abstract theoretical depiction of the mode of operation of capitalism? Or... To raise the question more generally, how do history and theoretical depiction relate to each other within the critique of political economy? A further question concerns the relationship between Marx's depiction of the capitalist mode of production and bourgeois economic theory. Is Marx presenting merely just another theory of the mode of operation of capitalism? Does this critique and the critique of political economy consists solely of previously existing theories being proven wrong in certain places so that Marx may present a better theory? Or does critique make a more comprehensive claim? To formulate things more generally, what does critique mean within the framework of the critique of political economy? Section 1. Theory and History Engels had already suggested a historical manner of reading Marx's account. In a review of the early writing, a critique of the a contribution to the critique of political economy in 1859, Engels wrote that the logical depiction of categories presented by Marx, logical here meaning conceptual theoretical, is quote, indeed nothing but the historical method, only stripped of the historical form and of interfering contingencies, end quote. And Karl Kautsky published a popular outline of the first volume of Capital in 1887, wrote that Capital is, quote, an essentially historical work, end quote. Then, at the beginning of the 20th century, it became common knowledge among the leading figures of the workers' movement that capitalism had entered a new phase of development, that of, quote, imperialism. Marx's Capital was understood as an analysis of, quote, competitive capitalism, a phase of capitalist development preceding imperialism. Marx's research, therefore, now had to be continued by analyzing the next historical phase of capitalism, imperialism. Helfrich in 1910, Luxembourg in 1913, and Lenin in 1917 took up this task in various ways. One also frequently hears from contemporary economists insofar as they don't reject Marx's analysis entirely, but that it is at best valid for the 19th century. But in the 20th century, economic conditions have supposedly undergone such extensive change that Marx's theory is of no use, which is why, no, why one hears so little of it in most economics departments. Such, quote, historicizing ways of reading Marx which are also typical of many introduction to Mar introductions to Marx's capital, are at the very least opposed to Marx's own understanding of his work. In the forward to the first volume, Marx writes the following concerning the object of his research. Quote, what I have found to examine in this work, what I, <laughs> quote, what I have to examine in this work is the capitalist mode of production and the relations of production and forms of intercourse that correspond to it. Until now, the locus classicus has been England. That is the reason why England is used as the main illustration of the theoretical developments I make. Intrinsically, it is not a question of the higher or lower degree of development of the social antagonisms that spring from the natural laws of capitalist production. It is a question of how these laws themselves, of these tendencies winning their way through and working themselves with iron necessity. End quote. Capital Volume 1, pages 90 to 91. Here Marx explicitly states that he is concerned neither with the history of capitalism nor with the specific historical phase of capitalism, but with rather a theoretical analysis of capitalism. Examined are the essential determinants of capitalism, 
those elements which must remain the same regardless of all historical variations, so that we may speak of capitalism as such. What is portrayed is therefore not a historically or geographically specific capitalism, but rather, as Marx says at the end of the third volume of Capital, quote, we are only out to present the internal organization of the capitalist mode of production, its ideal average, as it were. End quote. Capital Volume 3, 970. With this statement, Marx merely formulates the claim he makes for his account. Whether this claim is actually redeemed, whether Marx actually manages to portray the capitalist mode of production in its ideal average, is something to be addressed when we deal with the details of his account. The statements cited above clarify the level of abstraction of Marx's account. If the analysis is carried out at the level of the, quote, ideal average of the capitalist mode of production, then it actually provides the categories that must underlie any research into the history of capitalism or a particular phase. The notion that one must know history in order to understand the present has a certain justification when applied to the history of events, but not for the structural history of a society. Rather, the opposite is the case. To examine the constitution of a particular social and economic structure, one has to already be familiar with the completed structure. Only then will one know what to look for in history. Marx formulated this idea with the help of a metaphor. The anatomy of man is a key to the anatomy of the ape. On the other hand, indications of higher forms in the lower species of animals can only be understood when the higher forms themselves are already known. For this reason, the, quote, historical passages in Capital come after the theoretical depictions of the corresponding categories and not before. Thus, the well-known chapter about the, quote, so-called primitive accumulation, which concerns the emergence of the, quote, free wage laborer as a precondition of the capitalist relationship, is placed not at the beginning, but at the end of the first volume of Capital. The historical passages complement the theoretical account, but the historical par passages don't constitute the theoretical account. Although Capital is first and foremost a theoretical work, which analyzes a fully developed capitalism, and not a historical work concerned with the development of capitalism, the depiction is not his ahistorical in the sense that contemporary economics, it to a large extent, is. Economics assumes there is a general problem of economic activity that exists in every society. Production must occur, scarce means have to be distributed, and so forth. This problem, which is assumed to remain constant throughout all historical phases, is then examined using essentially the same categories. Thus, some cat economists view the hand axe of the Neanderthal as a sort of capital. Marx, on the other hand, realizes that capitalism is a particular historical mode of production, which is fundamentally different from other modes of production, such as ancient slaveholding societies or the feudalism of the Middle Ages. In this respect, every one of these specific modes of production contains specific relationships that have to be described with categories that only retain their validity with regard to these modes of production. In this sense, the categories that describe the capitalist mode of production are, quote, historical and in no way the his transhistorical categories. They are valid only for the historical phase in which capitalism is the dominant mode of production. Section 3. Theory and Critique. Within worldview Marxism, Marx was regarded as the great economist of the workers' movement who had developed a, quote, Marxist political economy that one could oppose to, quote, bourgeois economy, that is, the schools of economics that regular, regarded capitalism positively. Marx had supposedly taken over the labor theory of value of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, the most important representatives of so-called classical political economy. According to the labor theory of value, the value of commodities was determined by the labor time necessary for their production. 
As distinct from the classical political economist, Marx had allegedly developed a theory of the exploitation of labor power and the crisis per nature of capitalism. According to this view, there are no fundamental categorical differences between Marxist political economy and classical political economy, only differences concerning the conclusions of both theories. This is basically also the view of contemporary economics. In terms of the substance of his theory, Marx is viewed as a representative of the classical school who draws different conclusions than Smith and Ricardo. And since classical political economy is viewed as outmoded by contemporary economics, modern theory has bid farewell to the determination of value by labor, a contemporary economist doesn't think he has to seriously concern himself with Marx. However, as the subtitle of Capital makes clear, Marx's intent was not to provide an alternative political economy, but a critique of political economy. Today, a new scientific approach also contains a critique of previous theories, if for no other reason than to justify its own existence. But Marx was concerned with far more than such a critique. Marx wanted not only to critique particular theories, he does that in capital. His critique was aimed at, he does that in capital. His critique was aimed rather at the entirety of political economy. He wanted to criticize the categorical presuppositions of an entire branch of knowledge. Marx made clear the comprehensive character of this critique in a letter he wrote to Ferdinand LaSalle at the end of the 1850s. The work I am presently concerned with is a critique of economic categories, or, if you like, a critical expose of the system of the bourgeois economy. It is at once an expose and by the same token, a critique of the system. End quote. This critique of categories begins with the most abstract category of political economy, that of value. Marx concedes that political economy has grasped the content concealed in value and its magnitude, the connection between labor and value. But political economy is, quote, never once asked the question why this content has assumed that particular form, that is, why labor is expressed in value, and why the measurement of labor by its duration is expressed in the magnitude of value of the product, end quote. Capital Volume 1, 173-174. to 174. Marx is not predominantly criticizing the conclusions of political economy, but rather the manner in which it poses questions, meaning the distinction between that which political economy aims to explain and that which is accepted as so self-evident that it doesn't need to be explained at all, such as the commodity form of the product of labor. Thus did Adam Smith, the progenitor of classical political economy, proceed on the assumption that humans, as distinct from animals, had, quote, a propensity to truck, barter, and exchange, end quote. Adam Smith, 1776, I'm assuming that's the Wealth of Nations, page 25. Thus it would be a general human trait to relate all things to commodities. As, <laughs> thus it would be a general human trait to relate to all things as commodities. Let me slow down. <laughs> Within political economy, social relationships such as exchange and commodity production are, quote, naturalized and, quote, reified. That is, social relationships are conceived as a quasi-natural condition, as, as quasi-natural conditions, ultimately as the characteristics of things. According to this conception, things do not first obtain an exchange value on the basis of a particular societal structure, but rather in and of themselves. Through such a naturalization of social relationships, it appears as if things have the properties and autonomy of subjects. Marx characterizes such conditions as an absurdity and speaks of a, quote, spectral objectivity or occult quality. What he means in each case will become clear in the following chapters. In worldview Marxism, as well as in bourgeois critiques of Marx, such conceptions were usually glossed over 
or if you're viewed merely as stylistic peculiarities. However, with these descriptions, Marx took aim at a central issue of the critique of political economy, namely the naturalization and reification of social relationships is no way the re in no way the result of a mistake by individual economists, but rather the result of an image of reality that develops independently as a result of the everyday practice of the members of a bourgeois society. At the end of the third volume of Capital, Marx can therefore establish that people in bourgeois society inhabit the, quote, bewitched, distorted, and upside-down world, end quote, and that this, quote, religion of everyday life is not only the basis of everyday consciousness, but also constitutes the background for categories of political economy. The categories of political economy. The question was posed above as to what critique means within the context of the critique of political economy. We are now able to provide a tentative answer. Critique aims to break down the theoretical field, meaning the self-evident views and spontaneously arising notions to which the categories of political economy owe their apparent plausibility. The, quote, absurdity of political economy should be made clear. Here, the critique of perception, the question as to how perception is possible, meets the analysis of the capitalist relations of production. Neither is possible without the other. However, Marx's intent with capital was not simply to write a critique of bourgeois science and bourgeois consciousness, but also to formulate a critique of bourgeois social relations. In a letter, Marx described his work, not very modestly, as without a question, quote, the most terrible missile that has, hmm, the most terrible missile that has yet been hurled at the heads of the bourgeoisie, landowners included, end quote. For this purpose, Marx's intent was to point out the human and social costs connected with capitalist development. He attempts to prove that, quote, within the capitalist system, all methods for raising the social productivity of labor are put into effect at the cost of the individual worker, that all means for the development of production undergo an inversion so that they become the means of domination and exploitation of the producers, end quote. Capital Volume 1, page 799. Or as he put it in another passage, quote, Capitalist production, therefore, only develops techniques and the degree of combination of the social process of production by simultaneously undermining the original sources of all wealth, the soil and the worker. Capital Volume 1, page 638. Marx does not intend to make a moral critique with such comments. Marx does not accuse capitalism or even individual capitalists of violating some eternal norms of justice. He is aiming rather to state a matter of fact, that there is an imminent destructive potential of capitalism that is activated time and time again. On the basis of its manner of functioning, capitalism must always contravene the elementary interests of the laborers. Within capitalism, these elementary interests can only be protected in a temporary and limited way, but the situation can only be fundamentally altered when capitalism is abolished. Marx does not advance a moral, quote, right to an unscathed existence or something similar against the impositions of capitalism. Instead, he hopes that the growing insight into the destructive nature of capitalism, which can be established without recourse to morality, the working class will take up the struggle against this system, not on the basis of morality, but rather on the basis of its own interest. Not, however, on the basis of an interest of a better situation within capitalism, but rather on the basis of an interest in a good and secure life, which can only be realized by transcending capitalism.
Section 3, Dialectics. A Marxist Rosetta Sinone. Whenever Marxist theory is spoken of, eventually the catchword dialectics, or dialectical development, dialectical method, dialectical portrayal, pops up, and in most cases there is no explanation of what exactly is meant by this word. Most notably, in Marxist political parties, opponents in an argument frequently accuse the, each other of having an, quote, undialectical conception of whatever matter is being debated. Also today, in Marxist circles, people speak of something standing in a, quote, dialectical relationship to another thing which is supposed to clarify everything. And sometimes, whenever one makes a critical inquiry, one is answered with the know-it-all admonishment, admonishment <laughs> that one has to, quote, see things dialectically. In this situation, one shouldn't allow oneself to be intimidated, but should rather constantly annoy the know-it-all by asking exactly what exactly is understood by the term dialectics and what the dialectical view looks like. More often than not, the grandiose rhetoric about dialectics is reducible to the simple fact that everything is dependent upon everything else and is in a state of interaction and that it's all rather complicated, <laughs> which is true in most cases, but doesn't really say anything. If dialectics is spoken of in a less superficial sense, then one can make a rough distinction between two ways of using the term. In one sense, dialectics is considered to be, according to Engel's text, anti-during, quote, the science of the general laws of motion and development of nature, human society, and thought, end quote. According to this conception, dialectical development does not proceed uniformly and in a linear manner, but is rather a, quote, movement in contradictions. Of particular importance for this movement are the, quote, change of quantity into quality, and the, quote, negation of the negation. Whereas Engels was clear that with such general statements, nothing is understood about individual processes, this is anything but clear within the framework of worldview Marxism. Quote, dialectics, understood as the general science of development, was often viewed as a sort of Rosetta Stone with which everything could be explained. The second way in which dialectics is spoken of relates to the form of depiction in the critique of political economy. Marx speaks, of, uh, speak, uh, Marx speaks on various occasions of his, quote, dialectical method, and in doing so also praises Hegel's achievements. Dialectics played a central role in Hegel's philosophy. However, Marx alleges that Hegel, quote, mystified dialectics and that his dialectic is therefore not the same as Hegel's. The method gains importance with the, quote, dialectical presentation of categories. This means that in the course of the presentation, the individual categories are unfolded from one another. They are not simply presented in succession or alongside each other. Rather, their interrelationship, how one category necessitates the existence of another category, is made clear. The structure of the depiction is therefore not a didactic question, remarks, but has a decisive substantive meaning. However, this dialectical portrayal is in no way the result of the, quote, application of a ready-made, quote, dialectical method to, content of, to the content of political economy. Ferdinand LaSalle intended such an application which caused Marx to express the following in a letter to Engels. Quote, he will discover to his cost that it is one thing for a critique to take a science to the point at which it admits of a dialectical presentation, and quite another to apply an abstract ready-made system of logic to vague presentiments of su just such a system. End quote. The precondition of a dialectical portrayal is not the application of a method, a widespread misconception in worldview Marxism, but rather the categorical critique discussed in the previous section. And such a categorical critique presumes an exact and detailed familiarity 
and engagement with the substance of a field of knowledge to which the categories refer. An exact discussion of Marx's dialectical presentation is therefore only possible if one already knows something about the categories being portrayed. One cannot talk about the dialectical character of Marx's account or even the relationship between Marx's dialectic and Hegel's before one is engaged with Marx's account itself. The frequent characterization of Marx's account as, quote, advancing from the abstract to the concrete, end quote, also says very little to those who are first beginning to read Marx's Capital. Above all else, the actual structure of the presentation in Capital is considerably more complex than this formula, which stems from the, quote, introduction of 1857, would lead one to believe. I don't know why that was in quotes. Other than in the forward and afterward, Marx speaks very seldom of dialectics in Capital. He practices a dialectical portrayal, but without demanding from his readers that they deal with the subject of dialectics before reading Capital. Only in hindsight can one say that what is dialectical about Marx's account. For that reason, the present work does not begin with a section on dialectics.